So what we have here is a, a worm bin that um, in the summertime is very, very hot and worms are aquatic creatures, so to speak. Uh, so they're always gravitating to the moisture. So we put a trash bag on top of the worm bin. That way when the water evaporates, it condensates under the trash bag. Okay, so what that's gonna do is the worms will be up on the surface uh, in their surface eaters anyway. So it kind of works really, really well. Some of the uh, particles you'll see in the worm bin are actually um, uh, coffee chaff. It's a byproduct of uh, roasting coffee. Okay, so it works like a carbon bedding material for me. Uh, so uh, if you look inside, we've got plenty of life inside the compost. And this is um, when you pull the, pull the uh, plastic back, you're gonna see all the worms here in the, and they're all kind of hanging out. Part is the, um, the hot composting where everybody associates with, uh, you know, turning a pile and composting, and that's the initial part. Uh, mm -hmm. But what really happens when you put the compost into your garden or under your um, trees and stuff like that, then the cold composting process starts again. And this is where um, this happens. The worms are like worm shark. They're like whale sharks. So they're filter feeders and they're, they're feeding on all of the uh, soil web underneath them inside the bin. So in here, you're, you're going to end up having your protozoa and your nematodes and everything all the way through the web to the worms. It's a cold composting process. And they're continuing to break the uh, organic matter down to smaller and smaller particles, uh, which would make it available. It's sort of like a, a re okay. And that's exactly what happens out under your garden bed. That's why most most times your soil in your garden beds is the richest soil in your yard. <laughs> Another system that I have going on is uh, I make uh, compost tea on a, a called a Pumeister, and uh, we uh, just aerated. You can see nice rich compost tea. Uh, basically a pickle barrel that retrofitted with an air pump, aerated source with worm castings hanging in the bags, the film bags. What I'm making is just worm castings, oxygen, and water. Okay. There's no sugar source um, in, um, we don't recommend sugar sources because sugar is also what the pathogens are going to be growing by. Now, if I wanted to, I could add a nitrogen source in there, uh, be it organic like kelp or um, any uh, uh, hydrostolic catfish or fish, which is going to be a nitrogen source, uh, but not a nitrate source. So what we'll do is the tea being the probiotic, you would mix that into the tea, create nitrate, plant food. Um, presently, we just use it as a probiotic to enhance the availability of the existent minerals that are already in the soil. So I can drench it directly without diluting it. So, and what that does is allows the substrate to fungal dominate and bacteria dominate. Um, if you if you turn it, then you're aerating it, and you're you're breaking up the mycelial connections. And when you break the mycelial connections, you're at, you're killing the organisms, which is the problem with tilling our soil. And uh, we're turning the soil basically into CO2 very rapidly um, by breaking it up and what we and oxidizing it. And um, this way, it allows the the fungal growth to come in, and that allows us to grow a lot more things, like things that are forest loving. Um, instead of just the field crops that we've acclimated to bacteria dominated soil. So if you use um, a worm bin and you only put that worms have fungi in their stomach. So if you if you do the vermiculture, um, you get a little bit of both, but nothing fungal dominates like using high carbon matter and just leaving it sit for for eight months, sometimes to a year. 
um, is really the best way to go. And there's a lot of guys online that are doing that and promoting it, like Charles Dowding um, is doing a really cool compost video section um, on YouTube. And uh, yeah, I follow Elaine Ingham. She's really awesome too. But uh, she teaches that you do this kind of setup and then you put stacks in it and the stacks allow it to aerate so it won't, you don't have to turn it anymore at that point. You can fungal dominate it long term um, and it still reaches adequate temperatures if you mix it correctly. Uh, and then at the end result is like an awesome compost that you can grow pretty much anything you want to, uh, depending on how much you put down on the soil. But again, some things don't like the fungi. But then again, you look at uh, how like 80% of plants on earth benefit from fungi in the soil, um, whereas 70% of the plants on earth actually have to have it in order to exist. So, you know, fungi is really important when you're talking about getting it in soil and making soil and creating um, compost. And, and that's what we want to do is grow plants, right? So, you know, we want to be able to grow all the different plants that we want to. We just have to look at where they come from and then make the compost for those plants, whether we want it fungal dominated or bacteria dominated. So, but this is kind of like a fix all. It takes a long, a long time to do it. There are other methods um, like the Berkeley method that you can do it and get compost in maybe 18 to 30 days, um, which is usually around 35 for me because I don't turn it as much as they say. When I make piles, I make big piles. And I can take you over and show you. Um, so I, and when I first got into composting, I wanted to learn exactly how things grew. So I started actually growing fungi. Um, and this is my mushroom chamber, my fruiting chamber. So you can see that um, these are lion's mane mushrooms in here. And we've got some oysters that are growing. Um, and these are mostly oysters and, and lion's mane right now. But um, that's how I learned what fungi needed to grow in compost was to actually grow the fungi themselves. Uh, especially the choice edible mushrooms are awesome to grow because then you can eat them. It's wonderful. Um, but right over here, um, we've got what I call the, the Berkeley method um, slash moldering because I turn it and um, I don't want to wait the full eight months, but at the same time, um, we don't have to wait the full eight months if we, if we bacteria dominate it first and then mix in some high carbon stuff like um, I use wood chips and uh, there's like uh, the pine shavings that people use that have horse farms around here. I get the the uh, bedding and the shavings from them and mix that in, that's high carbon. Or any leaves that have been dried out, like this time of year in the fall, I've got my neighbors, they throw all their waste out and put it on the curb and I just go collect it because it's just hardwood leaves in these bags. And that's literally the best thing you can do. That's what nature does in the fall is drop these leaves on the soil to fertilize the forests, you know, and, and all we have to do is leave it there. But because we've been kind of uh, conditioned to, you know, make our lawns look pretty by removing leaves and allowing grass to grow. And so we're, we're pulling up the fertility when we do that, which to me is like, I mean, that's gold for my garden, right? So I just go around the neighborhood and pick up all the bags um, and then I mix it in. Right now, this pile has been going for about four months and it's pretty much done at this point. Like it was done a month ago. I could, I, I've been using a little bit at a time, but um, this is just going to get distributed. Uh, and then I'm just going to start making another one. So what I do is I, I use the debris and then I get manure from local farms. Like I was telling you, there's um, a place here in town that rescues cows and they feed their cows really good food. Like it has kelp in it, it has oats um, and fungal. Like if you want fungi in your soil, you need lots of grains and seeds and things that they eat in nature. So it's, it's kind of common sense. If you just see what they eat in nature and you put it in your soil, then you're gonna get that kind of organism growing. So that's what I do is, is I want the fungal dominated as much as possible because Elaine Ingham teaches that, you know, soil already has a lot of bacteria in it naturally. Um, and it's the fungi that we continue to churn up and turn. And when we're making our garden beds and we're planting plants and we're digging holes, you know, we're constantly breaking the mycelial connection. So what we really need to do is promote fungi. And uh, that's what I, I do, the, the different kinds of composting. But this would be the Berkeley method. So, uh, you can see it's, it's breaking down really well. Uh, it's more in the middle, it's a little more, more broken down. But um, that could actually stand to be turned a little bit. Yeah, that's one method. Um, and then the moldering. Uh, for the moldering piles, what I like to do is have two different bins. And I, I kind of got the idea from Charles Dowding in his videos, but 
he's got multiple bins and that way he's always got compost um, that he's, he's layering and then also compost that's sitting. So this is where I layer it uh, and uh, every year like I'll turn it over around springtime and then I'll grow stuff out of what's been sitting over the winter. And this has been my best garden yet. I've never had anything grow in my yard like what I grow in my compost bin. So like this year we had green striped kushal that grew and these, these squash got to be 15 to 20 pounds. These are huge squash. Um, and I've got videos on my YouTube page. You can see if you type in green striped kushal, I mean, these squash were amazing. I'd, I'd never seen anything that big in my life in terms of getting a vegetable from your, your garden. Like I've seen some of the yellow, yellow yams that they have in the Caribbean um, places. And man, those things are huge. But this, was, this is a treat because it's like five meals for two people. And um, it, you know, that's, we just grow it in, in, a, in the compost pile here. But that's how we know that it's ready to be put out on the, the uh, garden is when this, this drops and the, uh, the plants grow well. I mean, that's like a given. If plants grow well in it, then, you know, it's safe to put out. It's not going to burn other things, uh, especially the squash and the tomatoes. They love this high fertility like this. Um, but this is a, a, a mix of fungal and bacteria dominated. But it really depends on what you put in there, too. Like, if you're only putting kitchen scraps, then you're going to get more bacteria than fungi. The fungi like the high carbon and the grain and the oats um, and seeds, lots of seeds. Here's right in front of my deck. This is, I've got sweet potatoes down here. Um, and these... I don't know if you can see this, but these were hydroponic buckets, um, mm -hmm. but I'm getting away from hydroponics because you're using man-made chemistry and man-made chemistry has been proven to be inflammatory to human biology. So um, this is hydroponics is awesome for like propagating plants and getting like taking a tomato plant and breaking off each, each uh, sucker or, or uh, you know, stem and uh, just propagating it with roots. And I've got like, I start out with 10 tomato plants at the beginning of the season. And by the end of the season, I've got over a hundred easy just because of all the propagation that I do, you know, you take off the suckers and you just stick them in a bucket of hydroponic solution with a bubbler in it, or even do like a Dutch bucket system. Like this is a, see if you can see that. These are Dutch buckets in here. Um, and this whole system spans the length of my house right here, but it's all run off of this reservoir. So if you can see, it's just a, a, basically a trash can in the ground that I've got filled with solution. Um, and I'm switching over to, to using a lot more organic solution, putting compost tea in it that I'm making from the Verma bin um, and that I use, I get humic acid from the compost, the, the uh, moldering compost that I'm doing. I take a handful and let water run through it and trickle down and that gives you the humic acid. And I've been using that and the plants love it, but they need the, uh, the micronutrients and the macronutrients. So, you know, the, like the trace elements and the, the metals and things, and you know, you got to put those in because they're not gonna come from the compost, unfortunately. So you do have to do, at least I have to do some kind of um, non-organics right now, because I don't know another source to put in there that, that will work that's the correct concentration. And that's the trick, is getting these things in the correct concentration for the plants when you put them in solution, otherwise the roots will burn. You won't be able to grow them in, in, the, in just water hydroponically. Um, but I use the, the verma compost in all the pots that I make. So after the worms get up, making it real fine um, into uh, like, if you put, take vermicast and put it in a bucket with some water and just mix it around, it completely dissolves because it's completely digested organics at that point. It, it just turns to a, uh, to liquid. So um, I use that and put it in a bucket or put it in a can sprayer and use it on the end of my hose. That works phenomenally to fertilize the yard. So I don't buy any fertilizer. All my fertilizer comes from my neighbors throwing their trash out, basically, all their yard waste in the bags I was showing you. Um, they put it out there, and then I just mix it in with some manure I get. And, man, it makes awesome compost, and I don't have to do anything to the soil. Um, but, you know, I put about an inch or two inches every spring, and then I usually do about an inch every fall or so. But I do polyculture planting, so um, it's hard to, to just kind of, you know, take a, a wheelbarrow and dump it out and spread it. You can't really do that when you do polyculture because you're always planting stuff. You're interplanting every season. Um, so you kind of have to take handfuls and spread it out around the plants and it becomes a little bit of a tedious process at that point, but you don't have to do anything else the rest of the year. You know, the whole time that plant's growing, which we're doing permaculture. So most of the plants that we're growing here are growing either biennial where it's two years or some of them like the fruit trees will go 20 years, you know, a lifetime even. Um, so you don't have to do it a, a lot uh, in terms of like 
um, adding a lot to the soil. It's just once or twice a year is really all you need. Um, but when you've got plants everywhere, like for instance, this is my garden. Um, I just planted this out and there was a uh, popolo. This is a popolo plant and there was several of them in here. And I actually had to take two or three of them up um, because I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with popolo, but you need like a half a leaf to flavor an entire dish. It's so strong. Um, but it's a cilantro substitute. It was the original cilantro in uh, South America before they, um, in, or the, the Europeans came over and introduced cilantro. So uh, popolo was in all the dishes. And uh, so I started growing it because my girlfriend's what they call a soapy where they can't, she doesn't like cilantro. It tastes like soap to her. Um, mm -hmm. So we started doing this and it works out really well for sauces and things. We can get back to eating what I like, which is cilantro flavored stuff. Um, but what uh, it was too too cluttered in here, so I just took out a few things so I could get some some beets in. But that's basically what I'm doing. You can see, like uh, all my my garden beds are just full. I like to keep um, like a, what they call green manure, where there's just always plants growing. There's always roots in the soil, um, and when there's roots in the soil, your plants are giving soil exudates. Bugs need things from the plants, and then they give things back to the plants after they get them. So it's a, a symbiotic relationship. And they, you know, this is something that they want to happen. They want stuff from the plants and the plants want stuff from them. So all you have to do is get roots in the soil and the microbes for that particular plant will accumulate around the, the root system um, and they'll take care of each other. But it, it, you know, you have to have the organics in there in order for that to happen. And that's where the compost comes in it. But you know, you put biochar in it and that gives them like a house to live in. Um, and then you put your, your nutrients in it, which comes from the different plants. You can use medicinal plants, they, they call it in permaculture, um, which is like stinging nettle and things and comfrey that are high in minerals. And these are actually nutrition for the plants, but in the end result is nutrition for us. I mean, that's, that's the inevitable end is we want to get these things into us to, to be able to eat them and consume them and be healthy. Um, but just the, the trick is to keep it very thick. So you don't, you wanna have as many roots in the ground as you can but there's some things that you plant, like um, there's mint that's mm -hmm. in the back corner here and it's pretty much taken over. So when, when you put mint down, it's, it's a ground cover and it's gonna cover the ground and you got a plant in between it. It puts out a lot of rhizomes under the ground, little roots that shoot everywhere. Um, so you just, you can't like dig holes and like plant big pots and stuff, you know, because you'll kill the plants and you'll kill the roots. Um, but it's just a different method of doing it. And I think it works out really well because I don't have to do very much, you know, and that's the trick with permaculture. It's kind of like the lazy man's gardener gardening, where it's just like a fraction of the work involved, which is really attractive to me. I like that because like in America, we have to be out working, you know, we can't just spend all our time in the garden feeding our family, you know, we got to make that money. And uh, in order to do that, you have to have time away from your house constantly and, and not as much time in the garden. So I usually put about an hour or two in the garden every day, um, if I can. Not so much um, like once things start really get going, it's mostly the hour that I usually spend is enjoyable. You know, it's like walking around picking things um, or it's, it's walking around maybe pulling a weed here or there. But it's not, I'm not like, you know, tilling up and digging and wheelbarrows of dirt everywhere. It's not really like that. I mean, the compost maybe once or twice a year with the wheelbarrow and spreading it out and stuff. But again, it's, it's more um, therapeutic than anything, I think. You know, it's not really, I don't consider it work when I'm out here doing this. So, yeah. Uh oh, uh, food forest. The reason I call this a food forest out here is because we have the canopy system, we use the layers of nature. And like right now I've got pine trees, but eventually um, I'm planting other things so that the pine, they will grow up and, and uh, allow for um, the leaves to fall so I won't have to get stuff from the neighbors, you know. And, that way we can have like a closed loop system. But right now, pine, pine straw is not that good for composting. It takes forever to break down. Um, whereas like the hardwood leaves are really what you want. So we've got some oaks. And as soon as these oaks get bigger, man, this pine tree is coming down. Uh, and I've got fruit trees that are growing as well. And um, I'm gonna start growing some, or uh, having some other things come up like maple trees and things that grow in poplars that grow really fast and can produce a lot of uh, leaf litter so that we can make compost without having outside sources. You know, but I don't mind picking up my neighbor's trash. I think it's a good thing because if not, it would just go to the landfill and get mixed in, which I guess inevitably, if, if you're putting organics back into the soil, it's never a bad thing. But here it gets used for growing things for food, whereas there it would just be filling up a hole, you know, so. Mm -hmm.
I like the concept personally, but um, but yeah, so I can take you around and show you a little bit, but I, literally everything in my yard, um, well, not everything, because there were some things that I started growing before um, I got into permaculture, and those are not edible, but most everything else is edible. Like, as soon as you come out the fence, um, you've got plum trees, and there's a pear tree here. Um, this is Egyptian spinach. Um, this, these are okra plants, and uh, it's an asteraceae plant of some kind. I think it's fire tips. I'm not sure. It's, it's in the coxcomb family. There's coxcomb down there. Um, now I was surprised to find out those are edible, too. But there's peanuts down here growing. <clears throat> So, and you can actually see, I just put compost out um, a month ago, and you can see how, how nice and rich the soil is down here. So these are peanuts growing right here. And um, yeah, okra, and we got a whole bunch of um, tomatoes down here. This is a roselle hibiscus. You can see the okra growing. This plant is, in terms of compost and what it can do for you, people say it's not as good as fertilizer. I mean, you see this okra plant, people are always saying on the, the gardening groups how they really wish they could understand how to get okra to grow and make a canopy because this one lady was talking on there about how she used to put her chair underneath her okra plants and um it always amazed me like because i had never grown one that big and now when, that i'm growing with compost and the soil is fertile and you know the plants are having the relationships that they need which is really what nature's cycle is all about is the different relationships and connecting them I mean, it's it's so easy. Like all these plants that are growing out here are growing just so so abundantly. And again, this is the time of year where things are starting to die out. But um, I mean, these okra are nice sized. Let's see if I can get you where the light is. Um, I'll just break it off. Like wow. normally, when okra gets big, it's not edible. And uh, these are are at least like seven eight inches. You know, and that's edible. That's good. But okay, um, more stuff. What I like to do is uh, green manure, like I was telling you, and mm -hmm. daikon radish is another good one that's wonderful for that. So I ha I get bags of daikon radish seeds because they don't cost very much, and then I plant them everywhere, like in all the voids, all the cracks, and all the corners. And uh, the daikon radish is in the mustard family. So these, uh, all the mustard plants wasp lay their eggs and eat the, the uh, pulp out of caterpillars. And caterpillars are like the biggest predator in a garden, like, or the pest, biggest pr the pest in the garden. Borers destroy the plants. Like they, they bore into the vine. And then when they emerge, they explode out the stem and they break the stem in half a lot of times and kill the plant unfortunately, and it happens every year to all the plants that I have, you know, like a month or two after they really get to the maturity stage where they start producing fruit. So at the key time when you're like, yes, I get squash in the morning, you go outside and you're like, oh, there's holes all in it. Here I learned about green striped kushaw and Tahitian melon. And um, there's another one, Seminole pumpkin we grew. And I've got, you know, all these squash are in my living room right now in a big pile because we have so much. Um, and they're winter squash, which means they keep over the winter. So you grow them in the summer, and then over the winter time, they'll keep for several months and just by being on the shelf. And all these plants that I'm telling you about, man, are heavy food producers, you know? So if we get these plants growing well, we it's like having a grocery store right outside your house. You know, you, a, a produce store, you don't even have to pay for it. You can just walk right out, pick it, and leave. I mean, nothing gets better than that when you're hungry. These are huckleberries in here. Uh, that wasn't really a, a plan for us. That's more for the birds. So we try to create this ecosystem where we're feeding not just ourselves, but we're putting 20% back into the ecosystem. Um, and what that means is we're growing plants for the pests because in order to get the predator bugs around, you have to have at least a few of the pests for them to eat, right? I mean, it makes sense. If they don't have food, they're not gonna stick around. So we have to keep uh, intentionally keep some of the the, uh, the pest bugs around for the predators um, and so that's why we, we plant a lot of, of flowers and things to to bring in a lot of the different bugs um, like the coxcomb and these are um, pineapple sage down here and this is all red clover so red clover is edible pineapple sage is edible um, even the uh, the coxcomb man I can't believe that these are taro root up here and you see all the butterflies nobody's growing food nobody's caring about soil and soil's key. I mean, if, if you have healthy soil, 
and you understand soil the way it works with the biology it works the same way in our guts you know we've got the same microbes that are in the soil from the compost in our guts so literally if we learn how to make good soil we can learn how to be healthier ourselves that to me is important